It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I think we're coming up. Uh, I think you are now, Tegan, way out in front as the most numerous guest on the show and pushing it with Chris McColl. The Red Goss Hawk was pretty popular, but your episodes have been right up there. Tegan Douglas from BirdLife Australia, but the West Australian edition, and we know that Western Australia is so different to the rest of Australia. Tegan, thank you. Thank you for joining me again. We're going to talk about the Great Aussie Bird Count. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Grant. Thanks for that amazing introduction. I um, I don't even know how I could even com- try to compete against uh, red, against red goshawks, but I'll do my best. It's something that I've learned, Tegan, that seabirds have a strong following, but raptors seem to be the thing. I I thought parrots might be the favourites, but it looks like that hardcore raptor people are very hardcore. But then again, the red goshawk, what a bird. It is a stunning bird. I've seen them just once and it was just amazing views drifting overhead at at Kakadu and, yeah, I can't deny they're pretty specky. So there's a good opportunity to say, if you haven't listened to the episode on the Red Goshawk, look up Red Goshawk, Chris McColl, The Bird Emergency on any of your podcast catches or on the Bird Emergency channel on YouTube and you can have a look, Facebook even. Hello, Chris McColl. How's things going up in Queensland? I hope everything's great up there. You're out of lockdown. I'm not. Tegan, the yes. great Aussie backyard bird count. I've said it correctly, have I? Uh, close. The Aussie, the Aussie bird count. The Aussie bird count. Where mm-hmm. did I get great backyard from? It used to be called the Aussie backyard bird count. You called it great because it is. It is great. And Tegan... How many birds are great? All of them. Yes, you got question? the correct answer. It is a trick question, but of course, you're a doctor. You got it. You're the one. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about last year's bird count and have a bit of a prelude about when this year's. Yep. What I put a question out on Twitter the other day, Tegan, and mm-hmm. it was specifically about offsets, and it was my usual snark, and it was, can anybody please give me one example of where offsets have been um, positive and great? Now, I only say that as introduction because have we got any situations where our rare and threatened birds in the last few years are Mm -hmm. doing better from our bird count data than they were? Like, is anybody... Are any of our populations of our birds at risk in Australia mm-hmm. yeah. actually on the increase? I feel so you probably have to search a bit, like quite a bit down the list to find out those sorts of things. What? Uh, so to provide people with a bit of background to the Aussie bird yeah, count. Yeah, actually, let's talk it's, about what the yeah. bird count is before, <laughs> I, before we go running down rabbit holes. Tegan, Absolutely. BirdLife Australia runs a bird count. Tell us about that. How is it done? What's it for? So at the end of October is National Bird Week. This year it runs from the 18th to the 24th of October. Every year during National Bird Week, BirdLife run what is called the Aussie Bird Count and it's an opportunity for people across the country, no matter where they are, to record, to take the opportunity to do a quick citizen science survey and record the birds that they see theoretically in their backyard but in reality wherever they are. So last year's bird count had over, had almost 110,000 people contribute sightings. They had over 1,500 schools contribute and manage to count in a week over 4.6 million birds. That's pretty That's pretty cool. I'm just looking, yeah, I was just looking at my phone, Tegan, to make sure that I still had the app on mm-hmm. because a lot of it was really easy last year to do your count because we had a phone app, which was great. <laughs> Yeah, I probably, I'm sure that I've mentioned this before, but phone apps are amazing tools for citizen science. And so the bird count is the same. It has a web portal, so it's aussiebirdcount.com.au, and it also has has an app that you can, a free app that you can download 
the really neat thing about the app is that not only can you use it for submitting surveys during during National Bird Week, so in that week in October, but year round it works as a field guide as well. I think we talked about this last year when I don't know if we if we were looking at the app last time we talked about the bird count, but it's a really nifty app. And there's so many good ones now that you can use them in combination and you'll always be covered either with calls or with really good visuals or up-to-date distribution maps so that you can take a fair stab at any of the birds that you see and be reasonably confident that you will, you'll make a pretty solid identification. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And because that's one of the things we don't want, um, we don't want people to feel that they can't contribute to the Aussie bird count because they don't know their birds. So we encourage people to just if they're not that confident to start in their backyard to record the birds that they're seeing every day that they're going to be most familiar with. And yeah, that tool on the app that helps ID the birds that you're looking at is a really useful way to, to maybe pick up those trickier birds beyond laughing kookaburras and magpies and willy wagtails. Laughing kookaburras, your friends in Western Australia. <laughs> uh, so some say, but not me. International listeners, the kookaburra, which you may well be familiar with, certainly if you've been watching 1930s and 1940s movies that are set in Africa, you'll quite often hear the laugh track of the laughing kookaburra. Ooh, ooh, ah, 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 ah. Um, there we go. Look, But it's a pest species in Western Australia. We haven't prepared for this, Tegan. Are they on the are they on the increase in WA? Um, they're definitely. Oh, I was going to say spreading their wings, but I'm launching into the bird puns too soon, aren't I? Um, there are That's areas- my territory. That's my territory. <laughs> Bad jokes all-, all over here, please. We can all play in that sandpit, Grant. Yeah. Come on. So, yeah, the kookaburra, it is introduced to southwest of WA. The laughing kookaburra that is in the north, you do get the blue wing kookaburra that is there, that is a native that's, species. And that's the maniac bird. If you've, ever, <laughs> if you've ever listened to its laugh, that is the maniac bird. Yes, indeed. But yeah, the laughing kookaburra, it was actually deliberately introduced into a couple of locations around the southwest. It's pretty. I wouldn't necessarily, its numbers probably are increasing slightly. They're a territorial species. They're not the sort of thing that you get in big flocks like starlings or whatever, but you do get hairs of them tend to encroach and uh, take over habitat. There's been quite interestingly a sighting of one over, I think it turned, face turned up maybe just over a year ago in Esperance, just one bird that whether it, flew all the way there from I think the closest other locations. I think you might get them around Albany. I'd have to have a look, but definitely in southwest WA, but it's a long way for a lone kookaburra to show up. Whether that's a sign that more are on their way and they're slowly going to overtake all of our great all of our great south, greater southwest area, who knows? I hope not. I Me like too. geckos. I like <laughs> geckos a lot. So. I like geckos. I like frogs. I like yep. our legless lizards. I like baby birds. Yes, yes. So, yeah, kookaburras, we don't usually think of them as a murder, but the kookaburra is a murder bird. (laughs) They definitely are. And I think it's just, okay, I can understand that when Europeans first came to Australia, when the Swan River Colony was first established, that the idea of there just being snakes trundling around the place was a really scary concept. But they weren't just, yeah, nobody told the kookaburras that was the only thing on their menu. So, of course, they branched out into all sorts of things. But then there was also just the, oh, it doesn't sound Australian enough. We're used to this East Coast Australia where you get kookaburras in the dawn chorus. So let's bring some over to WA as well because that's what our our dawn chorus is missing. Now, I'm displaying my ignorance here, Tegan, but um, you've got miners over there, haven't you, Indian miners? Oh, We have yellow-throated miners. No blackbirds. Oh, so of course, actually... They've done you a solid, didn't they? They didn't bring the Indian miner over or the blackbird and go, hey, you can be just like Melbourne and Sydney. They said, have a kookaburra. That's that's true. Not without its own problems. In southwest of WA, we're lucky enough to not have not have Indian miners. We don't have blackbirds. We don't have sparrows. We don't have starlings. In fact, our, ag- our agriculture department has a very active project in keeping starlings from crossing the Nullarbor. Uh, so now... Urban myth or not, there are people on the eastern edge of WA 
who shoot starlings that might fly over. Is that an urban myth? It's there is an active project to catch them. So there are a series of like of cages and and things set up by the ag department to catch them. They would probably attempt to shoot some if there was a report. I don't. There's not a there's not a line of people with guns at the border. Ah. Oh. Well, not shooting starlings anyway. So you're not. Te- <laughs> so you ain't Texas. We're not. We might be the wild west, but we're not that wild. Uh, yeah, I well, mean, I that, suppose. Yeah. I was going to say we're quite lucky in the southwest. Most of our introduced species are actually Australian natives. So we do have spotted dove and laughing doves that are introduced and rock doves, but otherwise it's kookaburras, rainbow lorikeets and corellas and also galahs have, have been introduced as well. Uh, the corellas introduced, are they definitely? Or- so long builds? Long yeah, builds. so we... Yeah. yeah, the little corellas, it's probably a bit squiffy. We do get little corellas further up the West Coast. Whether they've self-introduced, they've probably definitely been supplemented by birds being released from aviaries. And ditto with the Lars were really uncommon in the southwest prior to the prior to the clearing of the wheat belt. So there's definitely some some dancing cockies and things that have been released from cages over time in Perth. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Visual joke, dear listener. I was just doing the dancing cockatoo. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's seen them in a cage, haven't they? Let's <laughs> let's get a little bit serious. You mentioned the total numbers. You mm-hmm. mentioned the total numbers of of participants and the number yeah. of birds seen. Have you got mm-hmm. a breakdown of the number of species that were seen? Did every species get a Guernsey? It didn't. They did not. So keep in mind that last year that large part like parts of the country were still in lockdown and I lockdown, think exactly yeah I'm pre- I might be slight I might have my timing slightly up but I think the restrictions were maybe just starting to lift around that time in Melbourne a couple of weeks either side but people yeah, weren't I think sort of- I think we were in lockdown for the count I'm just trying to think I'm pretty sure we were in lockdown or well, certainly in my yeah I think and I think you're right. I think we came out of it just after lockdown. Yeah. But regardless, movement yeah. and whatnot, people yeah, weren't travelling to their normal like holiday homes, other holiday locations. So a lot of people weren't dispersed around the country like they may have been before. So No, but despite so that, how, we managed yeah. to record 610 species. Okay, now, again, I didn't give you any questions, so we just said we were going to have a, <laughs> a wide-ranging discussion. Uh, yeah. How did that species number uh, Mm -hmm. compare to perhaps the previous count or two? So I'm actually just going to cheat and have a little bit of a look and see how it compared to previous years. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm a scientist and I like to refer to figures sometimes. Yes, yes, I Um, know. So it was... So the number of species was down a little bit from the 2019 count. So it was 626 species recorded in 2019. So for those um, thinking about it, there's roughly the new Australian Bird Guide has a list of 900 species that are on the list of having turned up in Australia. Keep in mind that there's, you know, a good 150 of those that are, yeah, that's right, things that are unlikely to show up. So anything around the 600 mark is pretty pretty significant. If you're a bird watcher that's seen 600 Australian species, you're feeling pretty chuffed legend. with yourself. You're a legend yeah, if you've broken right. 600. So. Absolutely. So for the population of Australia to be able to record that many species in a week is pretty impressive. So, yeah, we might not have seen as many birds last year as we had the previous in bird species the previous year, but, in fact, we actually had a, a much bigger turnout in terms of participation and I think a lot of that did have to do with lockdown. People were noticing no, birds in their backyards no, no, a lot no, more. No, no. Oh, you don't want a lockdown like a. That's not why it was uh, a, a good turnout. It's because you and I spoke about it last year, oh, and oh, everybody listened and got involved. Oh yes, yeah, silly me. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. That's, it's You're it's right. all it you. Us. <laughs> it's all you, Tegan. It's all you. <laughs> I was going to say us. There you go. But no, like we definitely noticed a lot more. And we so in previous years, the the majority of participation that we get had been from Queensland and New South Wales. And last year, by comparison, we had like a substantial increase in people participating from Victoria, which yeah, which was 
parts of which were under lockdown. So yeah, I think there's definitely a there's definitely an element of people taking the time to appreciate nature where they can. Mm. The only upside that I can see so far for COVID nineteen in Australia is the resurgence in burning in your backyard. There's been a big resurgence, actually, and that's it's not just in birds as well. It's all sorts of yep. um, nature based citizen frogs. science. Mm-hmm. Lots of people talking about frogs. People I've never appreciating had... their urban bushlands. It's, I've yeah. never had so many conversations about frogs in my local milk bar as I have in the last 12 months. And, hey, Jody Rowley, you are a legend, just putting that out there. All that work is it's it's paying off. I think, again, off the cuff, Tegan, do you think yeah. this sort of awareness, the penetration of not so much conservation but actually the citizen science being involved in information gathering and actually just being a participant in in the environment around you. I think that's it. that's really increased significantly in the last few years. Do you, do you get that feeling? Yeah, I definitely do. There's something really powerful from when you if you're submitting a survey during uh, National Bird Week to be able to submit it and see the number of bird seen uptick as you submit your survey and the number of surveys and number of participants tick up. There's something really powerful about being able to contribute to that. And when you see the results to go, oh, yeah, I had a say in that. I had some input into that. And we do see quite a lot of people that participate in the Aussie bird count and that's and who previously haven't contributed to programs like that. This is the thing that they do and they get involved every year, which I think is really lovely as well. Mm. Uh, again, totally Totally question without notice. Tegan, are you, uh, from a bird life point of view, are you seeing mm-hmm. some of that increased participation flowing on into membership or people attending events in the local the local branches of bird life? Yeah, we are. We are seeing an increase in on all of those fronts. And to be fair, it's been a really it's been a really weird sort of eighteen months for that sort of stuff to be happening. But yeah. one one pandemic does not a trend make. <laughs> No, definitely not. But we certainly are. We're seeing, so the great thing about the Aussie bird count is it does, because it is such a such a friendly way for people to get involved in birds and in citizen science, that we it tends to attract a lot of people who might consider themselves more, more general nature lovers rather than diehard twitchers who are going to be out looking for birds every week of the year. Now, for the international audience, because I know there are some of you, thanks so much, New Zealand, I think, have just wrapped up their count and chasing up the Indian bird count and Canada to talk about what's different with what they do, how they do it, and, of course, the important things, the results. And, look, the participation is as important as what the data has borne out because, hey, I don't know if you're taken, we're in a climate emergency. I had been made aware of that news, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. So the more people that are picking notepads, pencils, binoculars, cameras, mm-hmm. sound recording gear, whatever, if you're, your little eyepieces and going out and identifying fungi or your local bees or whatever, good on you because take someone with you, get them yep. involved too. Definitely. And it's not just about what you're seeing while you're out there. It's also that connecting with the environment. It has flow on effects for our mental health. Like we're much happier when we're out surrounded by nature and green space. So yeah, it doesn't matter that you that effect happens regardless of whether what you're looking at or not. I'm quite happy to lead bird walks and anybody who's been on my bird walks will know that, yeah, the bird aspect might be fine. My plant ID is rubbish but it doesn't stop me from enjoying myself and giving it a go anyway and that's the same no matter what your field of expertise is you'll get you'll definitely get enjoyment out of being out in nature but you can tell a dilwinia from a divisia can't you tegan oh maybe (laughs) you found my achilles heel ground i'm sorry i'm sorry (laughs) <laughs> okay, all the, all those egg and bacon flowers, Tegan. Oh, all, yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, well, Davisi, yeah. Are, Davisi are I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good. And the <laughs> Kennedy is 
Right. Anyway, look, yes. no, no, we, we've had enough, enough plant talk. Even my my Canidia postens is flowering in my garden at the moment. Oh, nice. So there. Very good. <laughs> um, international listeners, just look up Canidia's amazing plants. Very important in the ecology in Western Australia, particularly. Most of them are West Australian species. Yep. Tegan. Yes. Highlights. Let's talk about some of the really interesting things that the one week of counting uncovered? Yep. So what we tend to pick up in the from the Aussie bird count is that it tends to give us a really big reflection of what's going Like we're able to pick up those really broad scale patterns about what's happening at the time. It is just a one week snapshot, but in previous years we've had years where there've been really severe drought in the southeast and we've noticed lots of what would generally be considered arid zone burns, things like crimson chat and scarlet honey eater, for example, turning up in people's backyards and being higher up the rankings in the lists for the Aussie bird count. And this year there was, with the horrendous bushfire season, that was, sorry, last year's count, but with the horrendous bushfire season that, that had happened the year before, there was this worry that, or not this feeling that we might be seeing some of those bushfire refugee birds still showing up in in those areas, in, like, in like glossy yeah, black cockatoos turning up yeah, in yeah, yeah that's right or would our numbers be down horrendously because of the like the amount of habitat that had been lost in those bushfires sort of the the 10 months beforehand and what we because we had this massive effort we we're actually yeah we were recording those birds were still in those suburban spaces and it'd be really interesting to see whether we're with i know we in the southwest we've definitely had really big rains um and yeah, in the southeast, you've been copying it a little bit too. So it'd be good. It'd be interesting to see what those birds are doing after, hopefully, a bit of a return to to normalcy, whatever that means these days. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost too much to hope for, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it just? <laughs> I think I think we're all I think we're all in that sort of uh, frame of mind. Uh, Tegan. The- I always wonder with things like a survey where it's relying on a large number of participants to get meaningful <laughs> data, but mm-hmm. for nocturnal birds, how how did the, how did those numbers relate last year compared to previous surveys? I just wonder that's whether a question people were out I at don't night. actually. Yeah, um, it, that's a question I don't actually have information for. So usually. What we find, so the for those who haven't participated, the Aussie Bird Count uses a twenty minute survey window. Uh, you can do that at any time of at any time um, of day or night. Ordinarily, when we use a twenty minute survey window, so a twenty minute two hectare area search or any other twenty minute count, usually owls are something that are really poorly represented. But what we do tend to find with things like the Aussie Bird Count, people do tend to not just record birds in their backyard, but go to their favourite park. Yeah. And try and rack up as many birds as they can in twenty minutes, or you know, who wouldn't? Um, but they do tend to go to places where there are known to be tawny frog mouths roosting, for example, or yeah. they know that their local blue books are nesting or barn owls. And so, I'd find I'd suspect that they're probably present in slightly higher proportions than they would be if we we're conducting this as a rigorous scientific methodology where we sent everybody out at fixed times or whatever. Yeah, it just made made me think about the sort of lockdown and the movement restrictions, even if the lockdowns were a bit relaxed, is it really able to go out to their favourite national park and whatnot? So I just wondered if there was a difference with those, I mean, let's call them specialty birds. If you're looking for a powerful owl, you really need to know where they've been seen or else yeah. you're just fluking it. it yeah. yeah. So I think that'd be the same with the other nocturnal birds as well. Yeah. You can pretty much count on a barn owl if you're in in a grassy area and you're out at night. You can pretty much, see it, but I wouldn't think that you're going to see a master or a sooty. It's, uh, you need to no, know where they're hanging out. Most definitely. And if you're lucky enough to to live in those areas where you get those birds calling every night, then yeah, that's pretty neat. I was so pleased the other night. Actually, I've I moved into the property that I'm in in April last year and I've slowly been plugging away at a bird list. I live in quite 
sort of central Perth in just a unit that's not particularly surrounded by bushland. I had a I heard my first Southern Boo book call the other night from the neighbor's tree and I was absolutely stoked with that. Fingers crossed it's hanging around in October. Very good, very good. At least you, you got at least one murder bird around. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you get the barking? You don't get the barking owl over there, do you? They're extremely uncommon in the yeah. southwest. There are a few scattered records of them, but there's nowhere, yeah, mostly out in the forest, not in the suburbs. Yeah, unlike if you head to head to more tropical WA and they're pretty common there. They're a murder bird. <laughs> <laughs> You've, it, have you heard one? Yes, I have. Yeah. I've had the delight of trying to yeah. sleep while a pair were just carrying on in the carrying like on. in the tree above my tent. Yeah. So that was fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised they don't turn up in more movie soundtracks, more slasher movies and whatnot. They they are amazing birds. I might throw I might go to Zeno Canto and, and Zeno Canto, shall I should I say, get it correctly and and ins, insert here, I think, Tegan. They they're, they're great. Owls. Owls are amazing and it's been so good. Have you been seeing the updates of the pair at University of Queensland? With, yes, that have, yes, I have. Yeah, that have one that is just fledged or just fledged. How cool is that? That's what I love about Twitter and social media generally is that you can see the story as it unfolds. We don't have to wait for two years for it to be on a documentary on TV. And, yeah, that's been great. Thanks, Dr Nick. Yeah, and I think those birds are really, they're really great ways for people to get enthused about their suburban wildlife as well when you know that you have predator species that are there in your suburbs that you they're not there, like you, you don't see them unless you know exactly where to look or where to listen. And especially like the powerful owl, which is like a fl- a, f- a flying emperor penguin. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. They're, they're still on my, they're still on my to see list of powerful owls. I haven't yet had the the good fortune. So, oh, next time you head over to to Melbourne, there's becoming a couple that are quite quite well known that you can oh, reliably get out to some of the <laughs> parks, some locations and, and see them. Really great. What about the sort of icon, rare, endangered species that we're always worried about, Tegan? Did we get any good news in the surveys for, let's talk about a couple of your West Australian favourites, um, of course, and this, they're similarly geographically challenged the noisy scrub bird and the and the western ground parrot were they did they feature in the count? I'm just che- so. Um, this I'm is great. Just checking I'm putting the list. her. I'm pretu- I'm, you're putting I'm me totally putting on, the, on spot. the spot. I'm looking at the tops of the lists, not the bottoms. <laughs> well. um, so we. I'm pretty sure that we actually missed. We didn't get any western ground parrots in recording the survey, which is unsurprising. There's yeah, you know, not surprising at all. And I also think that we don't we didn't get any of those skulkers, the noisy scrub bird, western bristle bird, or I'm missing one. Western whitbird. Oh, western whitbird. I, mm. I I always forget that they're as rare as they are because of course they're they're still pretty ubiquitous if you're in the wet forests in Victoria anyway, mm-hmm. that you will hear them. You may never see them, but you will hear them or you'll yeah. hear a lyrebird doing its impression of a eastern whipbird. How perilous is the situation with the, the western whipbird? And where, where, are they, where are they known to be? Prominent. Yeah, there's actually two subspecies of Western Whitbird. Uh, one that's a Mallee form, that's a Mallee form, and is more widespread, and is actually is probably considered to be, even though it has a not a particularly large distribution, it they think that it is pretty like reasonably stable, pretty, pretty common. Yeah, that's what yeah. I always had in mind, having never mm. seen one. And then the other subspecies that is much more restricted to the the coastal heath. That, that's the that's area. Heath, that, that's the heathland. Yep. species so or some that's species. the one or, that gets or, oh i'm not sure yeah. where the taxonomists or, have it placed at the say, moment so uh, we have to start a twitter war if i we're yeah. gonna have to talk to maggie and ask about a client 
So. Yes, yeah, go on. But those the birds that are found in that neck of the woods, that southern coastal heath, that's the area that does tend to get unfortunately smashed by by bushfires and so that's yeah. why those birds are not doing particularly well. The so 2 years ago when we had those the really big fires through Sterling Range National Park in southwest WA, so that happened the same year that we had all the disastrous bushfires on the east coast. Yeah, they our population of western whitbirds was probably significantly impacted there because that was formerly quite a good spot for them and I think two-thirds, three-quarters of the park burned over those couple of days. Yeah. So that's so that's com- coming on to two years ago. How is that area bouncing back? That's an ex- – I haven't actually personally been down there. It definitely is, but it's really patchy. Anybody who's seen – it's probably it's quite – I imagine quite similar to, to places on the east coast. You get those patches where it still looks like a moonscape, just the fire was so intense that things haven't sprouted back. And yet somehow in the midst of it, these little patches where things are have re-sprouted quite, like where the existing tre- not, trees have re-sprouted and stuff's germinated from the seed bank and it's starting to bounce back and provide a bit of habitat. But, yeah, it'll be it'll be a few years, like more than a few years yet until it um yeah, is starting to look useful for a lot of our birds that we used to get there. Yeah, the birds that live in those kind of habitats aren't, well, apart from perhaps some of the honey eaters, but they're not big movers, are they? Like they're, they're not capable of moving really significant distances. They're, they're limited to a couple of miles or a couple of maybe a so- dozen kilometres. I'll try and yeah. wind back my old man talk there. <laughs> nice save, nice save. Yeah. Um, some of them definitely are territorial. So we know things like the um, noisy scrub bird, for example, is really is quite territorial and does have reasonably small territories. And I think that's also the same with Western bristlebird. But we know things like Western ground parrot are a lot more reasonably more mobile, but they are still restricted. There's such a small patch of viable habitat that even though they're moving around, there's still just not that many. Of them. Parrots mm-hmm. in the bird count. Yes. Let's go to parrots. Parrots topped the bird count. I'm sure cockatoos and the and corellas topped mm-hmm. the bird count. Would that yeah. be right? So just the same as in 2019, it was a rainbow lorikeet that topped it. So this is nationwide. And the thing to, of course, remember is the things that tend to come out at the top, like towards the tops of these lists are things that have a really big distribution. So they're picked up in lots and, and lots of surveys. And like gardens, like to be around at the yep. altered habitats that we've yep. that we've created. Absolutely. So, yeah. If you yeah, if you look at the top ten list for this year, or sorry for last year, it is most definitely a snapshot of the common birds that you would expect to get, um, particularly on in towns and cities up the up the eastern seaboard. So what a but yeah. what a segue, Tegan. What a segue. <laughs> top ten. Let's top do 10? the top ten. Do you want to do it in reverse? Um, I've given away the number one, though. That's a bit hang on, rubbish, hang on. isn't it? Coming in at number 10. Number 10 for the second year in a row has made the top 10 is the, the delightful, loved, sometimes hate, although sometimes hated, bin chicken, the Australian white ibis. Ah, oh, the bin chicken. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. And So, yeah, the only – no, we've got two – Two watery, frequenting birds in the top ten, but yeah, that's it's probably number the nine. Number nine this year, uh, only found on the east coast, common minor, so a non-native in the list. And, well, which people who are as old as me would call the Indian minor. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So. Yep. Number eight. Number eight, the well-known thiever of chips, the silver gull. Ah, oh, the seagull. Ah, good stuff. They're, Absolutely. I, lo- I, I love They're seagull. They're beautiful. They're beautiful-looking birds. Oh, yeah. They just have a very poor habit of hanging out at rubbish tips and thieving food at restaurants. Well, they're smart. They're smart. They're smart. Why go looking for anchovies when you can get a chip from some dude who just got off the train? They are. They're right up there. Mm -hmm. Number six. Oh, do you mean? Oh, hang on. Number seven. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Click, clickety, click. It was the welcome swallow. So I actually thought this was a a really nice find. It's not a bird that everybody can recognize. They're small and usually zipping around in the sky, and we have a few birds that fit that that category. 
on on that one, Tegan, mm-hmm. how, that's a widely distributed, but certainly yep. in my locality in mm-hmm. Ma- in Western Melbourne, it's yep. far less common than it was. So okay. I'm wondering if there was a skew with the numbers in different parts of the country, maybe there. Maybe they've moved north or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's we are getting more and more coverage across the country as the the, the counts progress as we move through the years. And yeah, so there's no reason why. Like it, it could be down to a lot of reasons. It could just be that we're getting surveys in from different areas, or it could be a legitimate change. They're actually. I just had a look at the 2019 results. It's actually the Welcome Swallow actually has bumped up two spots. It was in ninth position in 2019. And is now in okay. yeah it was seventh this, uh, last year. Who knows where it'll be this year? When I was young, back when mm-hmm. back before they invented the wheel, the uh, e- every building, everyone mm-hmm. shared had a had a swallow nest. You know, they were everywhere. Yep. Much much less frequently seen in in my experience. And of course, who else's experience counts, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean it just yeah. I'm glad to see that it's gone up. I'd really like to see that like the dig down into the numbers and see whether that there's far more of them in, in inland New South Wales and inland Queensland and whatnot now and how that compares to the coastal fringe, the southeast fringe, which, yeah. which is where I'm most familiar with seeing them. Yeah, I mean, we're hoping to be able to delve into the data a lot more this year as well. But, I mean, yeah, Welcome Swallows, I think we probably... We, they would have at least suffered a bit of a decline when local councils were going through the phase of just of spraying chemicals around wetlands to, to keep midges under control instead of relying on the welcome swallow nature's own midge control. So, yeah, since councils have started to switch to more envi- environmentally friendly ways of managing those sorts of insect problems, I think welcome swallows have been one of the, one of the beneficiaries, that's for sure. And probably the other thing to mention about this list, sorry, you were just going to jump into another number, weren't you, <laughs> is that the, it's about the the top ten, like the numbers that are seen as well. It's not the proportion of surveys that they show up in, but it's the numbers that are seen. So when you see flocks of welcome swallows, that's, yeah, that definitely bumps them up the list. Now, that, there's a really interesting rabbit hole to go down, Tegan. We're talking mm. about raw numbers of birds, but we're yeah. not talking about the proportion of either surveys or locations. That's right. Uh, will that manipulation of data happen or is there a way for people to actually interrogate the data if they want to find those things out? Do you like that was me that was me doing scientist talk. I've learned oh. scientist talk. We're going to interrogate the data. Delightful. I'm not unfortunately I'm not able to do it on the spot as we're chatting <laughs> as we're chatting live about it. But it's definitely something we'd like to give people the capacity to have a look at in the future. And it's it definitely is an aspect. I know, sorry, I'm not sure about you, but I've been seeing lots of pictures of massive budgerigar flocks. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Well, in like Northern Territory and in Northern Western Australia at the moment, if they were hanging around in October, it wouldn't take too many of them to flocks of 10,000 birds to bump up the numbers, that's for sure. The budgery pictures that people were um, sharing on social media was getting lots of traction worldwide. And actually, I listen to, like, I'm a freak, right? I do. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> well, I do a podcast about birds. I'm out there. <laughs> and I listened to BBC World Service overnight mm-hmm. when I'm <laughs> when I'm dreaming up who I can interview next. And they were doing they they covered on a couple of programs the mm-hmm. they were calling it an eruption of budgerigars, but I think it was probably not so much a, a special eruption. It just happened to be that there were people who saw these flocks. I think this is really regular occurrence for budgerigars. It's just not usually in front of someone with a camera. Yeah, it's probably a mix of both. I know definitely that the Kimberley had a really good wet season this year and they had quite a few, they had a couple of cyclone events drop significant amounts of water through that, like across that country. So it provided perfect habitat, perfect habitat for budgerigar numbers to to build up. So it's a combination of there being good conditions and also people in the right place at the right time. But it definitely is a natural wonder, that's for sure. Yep, budgerigar. 
the world's most I'm popular cage bird and and you don't see blue ones out in the wild. I have yet to see one, that's for sure. No, no. I think they're always green. Look, again, Tegan, you're a West Australian. There's more budgerigars in West Australia than there is in the northwestern suburbs of Melbourne. Yellow ones, albino ones, are they, are those kind of morphs seen regular? Not, Do you hear not that I see. So my I mean, to be across bird species in general, my experience with seeing leucistic birds or birds that are, that are only that have certain like pigmentation things going on is that it's usually not the whole bird. It's usually just a patch, just a part so, of it. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen silver eyes that instead of being that beautiful olivey green color on the head, just have a large patch of yellow. Yeah. It's and it's usually the aviary breeding, the aviculture that um, leads to the entire bird being that color. In nature, it's usually just a. It's quite often just a patch. Creating freaks, you mean? <laughs> Creating natural <laughs> variability. Number six. Number coming in at number six was the delightful non-native but still lovely house sparrow. Now that that does surprise me. I reckon yeah. that data would be really interesting to have a look at about where those records have come from. Absolutely. Uh, They're I, definitely one that people think is has been on the decline in some urban areas of late. But certainly I, I can't remember if I had this discussion with you, Tegan, but when one of the reasons that I actually decided to do the podcast, I'd always mm-hmm. wanted to talk about birds, but... Yep. The whole bird emergency idea came to me because I started to notice that there were less and less sparrows. And then mm-hmm. when I thought, gee, there's less rosellas. Oh, there's less honey eaters. So for me, that was a an indicator. Now, of course, yep. I might be the most special, but one person's data does not a trend make. So You're not the only person to notice that, though. So, well, I'm glad there's other people equally as clever and switched on as me, Tegan. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> no, that, uh, that That's really interesting. Mm. As much as I wish it was red, red-browed finches or double-bar finches or something occupying number six, yep. hopeful in a way if that decline has been arrested, but not it's- if it's only that species. That's a different yeah. issue. That's right. And it's quite interesting also because, uh, and the, like I mentioned earlier, that's a species that you don't find in Western Australia. I don't think, I assume you don't get them at all in the Northern Territory. I'm not sure I about that. I wouldn't have thought so. I think. No. I, 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 don't, I don't even know how far up the north coast of Queensland they have, they have gone. Certainly when I lived in Brisbane, which was quite a long time ago, they were not common in Brisbane, not like they were in Sydney and Melbourne. And when you look at the top three lists for each state and territory, so how... We can do... We'll, we'll do this... At the end, we'll do the state breakdown. Okay, and we'll sure. talk about yep. those. Let's put the swallow, uh, the sparrow aside for a minute and mm-hmm. we'll go... And bringing in the rear of the top five. Number five is the delightful galah. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yes. Good. Yeah, widespread. So there's the first year parrots yeah. coming onto the list. Okay. And probably for the international listeners, a lot of people are amazed at the just what a galah looks like. But they're, in, in a way, for Australians, we're so familiar with them in, in that in a lot of cases they're almost invisible to us. We just don't notice them, but they are amazing creatures. That's good. I'm really happy that they're still at the top of the tree. Yeah. Number four. Number four. I also thought I thought this one was an interesting one to make it to the into the top four. Sulfur crested cockatoo. They they have definitely had a resurgence. They mm-hmm. are well, they're they're everywhere in suburban Melbourne now. Yeah. They yeah. ne- never used to be. Again, I'm going back to the in the Roman days. They definitely uh, are one of our really adaptable, and yeah, we definitely classify them. Well, as they're an so urban bird clever, these days. They're mm. so clever. And if we're going to com- continue to put street trees out that have a good food source for them, they're going to spread. And they, they're nesting 
in all kinds of opportunistic places in the cities. Yeah, that's definitely true. I just, yeah, I suppose my, they, there was only this feral population of them in Perth, but a very one, and then you, they're not completely, like, they're not widespread across that, that southwest, coast, so most of South Australia um, so, and southern Northern Territory and yeah. Southern Western Australia as well. So yeah, I mean, that's my Southwest bias coming yeah, in. You no, see, the, Car- the, the Corellas replace them Ge- generally in in the drier parts of the country. They're becoming a very adaptable urban bird. Number four. That was number. Four. Oh, we just did number four. <laughs> Sorry. Number. Uh, See, rabbit holes confuse yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. Number three. 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 The, they're, they're, the again, green ribbon. used for the wrong reasons, Australian magpie. Look, they don't have much to talk about other than, oh, someone got swooped by a magpie. Oh, what are our posties going to do? Um, come on. Stop throwing stones at magpies. Stop standing under their nests and glaring at them. And when the ones who are already swooping you have become geriatrics, maybe the young ones won't swoop you. Just come on, people. Magpies. My local magpie doesn't swoop me because I don't upset him, but he swoops other people. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure I told this story before. I like going and sitting in the park. And at the moment, he is terrorising mm-hmm. all of the local corellas, cockatoos, yep. wattle birds, anyone. He's, he nests in a tree virtually straight out outside my place. Mrs. Magpie is currently busy incubating. And Mr. Yep. Magpie, he's driven off last year's kids. They've gone. They're nowhere mm-hmm. to be seen. Yep. And he is terrorising Selected individuals. He doesn't terrorise everyone. He doesn't terrorise little kids, but he terrorises other men. Mm-hmm. Not me, but generally yeah. other men. And he doesn't like people with pushes, from what I can tell. Incredibly yeah. smart bird. I don't think we give them anywhere near enough credit for their intelligence. No, but definitely not. Don't give them a hard time. Don't go and stand under their nest. And well, I, I think the thing rocks. is as well, because they can recognise faces, they can judge you based upon, you know, they, they you are do. profiling. They've profiled you and you look like somebody yeah. else who has caused the mischief and so yeah. better to be safe yeah. than sorry. And Yep, put an ice cream container on your head and draw a couple of eyes on it. Isn't that what, did you used to have, have to do that? Oh, uh, are, they, are they a problem in Perth too? What, swooping they, magpies? They do swoop. I don't think that they are as as aggressive as they are in other parts of the country. I've never been swooped despite my long days spent magpie pestering. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's they yeah, they are smart and they do recognize faces, but I think there's also there's a lot more tools that we use to prepare ourselves for magpies. The count city councils are a lot better at signposting areas when birds do start nesting there's that there's a like a there's a web page or a facebook group that sets up alerts for around nesting birds so it becomes a lot easier to avoid problem areas particularly if you're on a bike or whatever it is that seems to trigger them our postie doesn't get swooped by this magpie either he must be relieved yeah, no, the postie doesn't cop it with this <laughs> magpie i haven't yep. i've never asked him about the the other magpies, but it's really interesting. He doesn't go after little kids. He uh, mostly men and women with pushes from what I uh, and yep. haven't seen him go anyone on a bike either. Oh, so, okay. You've got the uh, you've got the anti magpie. No, I've just got a really clever one. Really <laughs> clever one. Look going off topic again, because I, I've got a park straight out the out the front and during yep. lockdown it was very difficult to do any bird watching. So with my supermarket delivery, I started ordering wild bird mix seed and putting yep. it out directly across so I can sit in the lounge room and watch mm-hmm. the corellas, the long long bills, little corellas, galahs, sulfur crests come in. Yeah. Well, during swoopy season, I thought what mm-hmm. I'll do is I'll put the seed out under the fence, under the railings, so that it was mm-hmm. harder for the magpie to drive off the, the cockies. Yeah. Well, he woke up to that. He starts sitting in a different tree and he worked out if he goes to the far extremes of the park, 
he can come to the lowest point, clear yeah. under the fence and land mm-hmm. on the an- TV antenna on my place. So took him a few days to work it out, but he's worked it out, and when he wants to drive off the, the seed eaters, he does. The yeah. fence is no obstacle. So, no, no, they're pretty smart. They are super smart. What are we up to? No, uh, uh, that was number three. A, uh, we're, we're up to the red ribbon, silver medalist. Uh, coming in at number two is the noisy miner, yeah. of course. You knew it was in there somewhere, right? I, well, in, in a way, I'm a little bit surprised. I, again, I'd love to interrogate the data mm-hmm. because you're looking at number of bird, number of records of birds. Yep. Now, I'd really like to know how many places it was in the top three. I imagine that in high-density urban areas, it's up high, mm-hmm. probably where the most participants for the survey and, and yeah, noisy miner. It's a honey eater, sociable, aggressive, bully, dominant. So if you're only seeing five or six species of birds, and you're in an urban area, especially with parks and edge planting. That's mm-hmm. my sort of view that I generally see them not in, you don't see them out in the middle of ovals or park parks with big expanses. They're always mm-hmm. on the fringe. Yep. Golf courses, they love golf courses because of that mm-hmm. edge planting down each side of the fairways and whatnot. They love a calistamine. They <laughs> love a calistamine. Uh, <laughs> Actually, scientist alert. Yes. I've always said calistamine, but are you saying calistemon? I say calistamine, but I'm not a no. No, no, you're a scientist. I'm taking (laughs) that's a win. We're taking that. Drum roll. (laughs) Number one. Who's number Number, one? Number one. One of the most colourful birds in the country, the rainbow lorikeet. Ah, uh, rainbow lorikeet, problematic fellow now, though. In the southwest, and in the news lately because of a weird new disease that is afflicting birds in northern New South Wales, southern Queensland. I haven't been keeping up to date with that. What's the what's been happening there? I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too okay. much. Are you spoiling another episode? There's going to be another episode quite soon. About about that, yeah, Excellent. it's lorikeet paralysis, which yeah, haven't had the discussion yet, but it had, was brought okay. to my attention a bit, and yeah, chased it up and got some names, mm-hmm. so we'll be doing that soon. We're going to take a little break here because there's quite a bit more to come as Tegan goes through the results for each state. So look out for that. That'll be coming along very, very, very soon. But here's your reminder. You can get involved in the Aussie backyard bird count. You should do that by registering at aussiebackyardbirdcount.org.au. You've got several weeks to get ready and to get into it. Please do so. Citizen Science needs your participation. Look out for updates at birdlife.org.au and always have a look at birds in backyards. Look out for part two of the Aussie Backyard Bird Count episode featuring Tegan Douglas in just a matter of days. I'm Grant Williams. Bye.